Once again, remember the point of revelation is to reveal stuff, not conceal stuff. And that's so important. The first readers would have looked at it and known exactly what everything meant. And half the times they would have laughed their heads off. Uh, it's typical of Jewish writing, both Old Testament and New Testament, because the New Testament writers are all Jews, that when they deal with really tough stuff, they often get funny. The funniest book in the Bible is about genocide. Ooh, <laughs> that's called Esther. It's loaded with humor. Because that's how you handle tough stuff. So, and any psychologist will tell you that. Um, I'll, I'll give you this. If you're feeling down and you're feeling a little anxious and you're worried about, you know, and, and you're taking yourself a little too seriously, here is a psychologist's guaranteed, statistically researched way to brighten your mood. Ready, gentlemen? <laughs> you saw it here. Okay. So let's dig into soils, uh, into uh, scrolls and trumpets. First of all, you can see how simple revelation is. Well, we're breaking it down to there. See, that's still, well, it deserves another breakdown. But that's, well, here comes the review real fast. We're going to cover chapters 6 to 11. So we're going to look at seven seals and seven trumpets and, and, and cats and dogs living together and all kinds of stuff. So let's go now to great detail. Isn't this nice how nice I am? There we are. Now you can actually practically read that. Okay, here we go. So if you start with chapter 6 of Revelation, out come four horsemen. Dum, da, 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 dum. How many of you have read a book called The Four Horsemen? There's actually a John, what was it? A, it's a German spy novel called The Fifth Horseman. So um, everybody thinks of that. They're going to come. Who, where are they going to come from? I love this. They come straight from Zechariah, and they also come from some other places. But there are four of them that get released. And there's number one is war. And this one just goes out and creates all kinds of violence. The second horseman is conquest. Now, some people have those flipped, but let's not worry about that for today. All we know is one horseman is going and running over all the weak countries and taking over for a big, gigantic empire. Sounds a little bit like Egypt. Sounds like Babylon. Sounds like Persia. Sounds like Rome. I don't know any other countries in the modern era who, who, who would like to stomp all over other countries. Um, some, you know, sounds like another day in, in, in the world, you know. And then there's, you know, the, and, and then we talked about war, famine. Um, this is all about economics. There's this little saying that's cried out, you know, six days wages for some grain and, and another three days wages for something, you know, an, an, I think for flour. And then it says, and oh, don't forget to get some wine and olive oil. And the first half of it talks about how much it costs to get the basic needs to feed your family. And the vast majority of people living during the period that John wrote this were in grinding poverty. And how you're going to feed your kids was an open question every night. Because if you were a farmer, the people who owned your land took like 60% of your crops. And then, and never mind you did not own your land, you were taxed by King Herod, another big chunk. And then you were taxed by the Roman Empire, another big chunk. Which means, you know, your take on that whole thing was this little, 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 little bitty stuff for somebody's lunch. And so even if you had large fields, you still may not be able to feed your kids. Meanwhile, the people for whom Rome was working, they had all the olive oil to dip all their nice, you know, bread in it with a little bit of spices. They had fantastic food, you know, their wine, oh, Italian wines. That was great if Rome worked for you. The vast majority, the vast majority of the population of Rome was slaves. The next level were people in grinding poverty. The next level were women who were not even citizens. And then there was the white ethnic Italians. And Rome worked for them real good. Just like South Africa worked for people who were Dutch and English descent. And that's the problem with empire. I don't care whether it's Babylon or Egypt. It works for the people who are in charge. Don't work for anybody else. And so famine is not famine that's coming out of the blue that, oh my gosh, everybody's suffering. No, this is a famine that's manufactured. They could do something about it first century. And then the fifth one is death. And if you read it, it starts out and it's all the effects of war and poverty. Plague. Every time you have a war, usually a plague breaks out because the entire infrastructure is destroyed. All the hospitals are gone. All the medicine's gone. And people die of curable diseases. Starvation. We just read about that. 
You know, it's interesting. If you listen to the video that this comes from, and by the way, I encourage you, two, it's two videos on Revelation, BibleProject.com. Look it up. It's free, 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 free. And this is the wild thing. After they finish all this, they say, oh, another day in the life of the world. It's true, isn't it? Now, what is God saying about this? This isn't about what's to come. This is naming the truth about what is. Did you know that most of the time, now every now and then the prophets will tell you what's to come, but most of the time what they're telling us is what's going on. They're telling us the hard truths we don't want to pay attention to. Now, this was also good news for the first readers because guess what? Most of them were either slaves or poor. And, and, and what they're hearing is finally someone's telling the truth. And then we keep on going. Then there was the martyrs, and they're by the altar of God. And these are the people who've been killed by Jerusalem and by Rome for disturbing the peace of Rome. And that's a phrase that was used throughout the Roman Empire, Pax Romana. Sounds like cheese, doesn't it? I want a little, you know, Pax Romana cheese on my, you know. Um, but it literally meant the peace of Rome that was maintained by the military of Rome. And the peace of Rome, once again, was great for all those in charge. But if you managed to stick up your head a little too high, it got lopped off. To keep the peace of Rome. Another word for that is the status quo. I think about that, the socialist state of Stalin. How did they, the peace of the Soviet Union was taken care of by the secret police. And they used to brag, you could walk in the streets of Moscow at midnight and you would be safe. Well, unless the secret police came and swooped you up. But the whole point is everybody was so afraid nobody was on the streets at midnight. <laughs> And so, once again, empire, in this case the Soviet Union, could have been Rome, rules by terrifying its subjects, and that's how it maintains its peace. It's a false peace, because right under it are people that if they can, they will take it down. Where the true peace that comes from heaven, not come from a dictator ready to step on you, not someone who's coming to take your life to keep peace, but someone who comes to give his life to make peace. To, to keep peace. And it's not just the peace of placating someone. When Christ comes and gives his life and raises from the dead, the peace he's giving you is the shalom peace of God, which means wholeness. It means that he wants to rewire you back into the human being he's designed you to be all the time so that you are completely made in the image of God, doing what you've call, been called to do, that you are ruling in the servanthood of God, that you are watching over and taking care of others just like God does, and that you are helping others just like God does. God aims to, to re hit the reset button and put you back to Genesis 1 and 2. That's God's peace, and he bought it with the cost of his own life. God's in the, in the giving his own life, not the taking his own life business. And that's right there. And then we get the day of the Lord. Tum, 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 tum. And this is why I have my handy dandy Bible, and I want to read a little bit of this. Um, this shows you a little bit of how Revelation is written, that the seven seals and the seven trumpets and later on the seven plagues each one of them practically completely destroys the earth. And then the earth resets and gets destroyed all over again. Somebody counted and the earth gets completely blown apart three times in Revelation. And so I want to read you one of these. Uh, the other is, and, and Revelation tells you this, this is symbol. So here we go. We are on the sixth seal. For those of you who are reading Revelation, this is chapter, let me find the chapter, six verse... Um, let me get to the right spot. Thir verse 12. I'm reading from the, uh, the, New International, the, uh, the New International Version. I watched as the angel opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake, okay? The sun turned black. Okay, all you scientists, um, sun turns black. Okay, how long before we all freeze to death? About 48 hours is what I, I'm told. Um, and then, by the way, the, the, if we manage to get inside and, and bundle ourselves up, um, the atmosphere will sooner or later crystallize and just float off. So not only are we freezing to death, there's no air outside. So just that one would take the whole planet out. Oh, and then the moon turns to red blood. Imagine if it turned to red blood. Suddenly it changes its substance. What's that going to do to our tides? You're going to see the mother of all tidal waves attacking the coasts. That's going to take the earth out. Oh, and how about this one? The stars from the sky fell through the earth. Man, they have to get in line. 
Just one of us is going to take it completely out, whatever's left. We're done. And then there's more stuff that's happening, but it's too late. There ain't no earth no more. You know, it says the sky receded like a scroll. Well, wait, there's no oxygen because the sun turned to black. Well, now we got more. And then every mountain and island was removed from this place. That's called seismic activity at a level no one's ever seen. No one's alive. And then it says, then the kings of the earth, the princes, and the generals, the rich and the mighty, and everyone else hid in the caves. There's no caves to hide from. Is that because the writer of Revelation is stupid? No, he knows exactly what he's doing. This is so important. These symbols point to how absolutely radical and cataclysmic God's restorative justice will be on the planet. He is actually foreshadowing, this is a spoiler alert, of what's going to happen in Revelation 20 and 21. In other words, just as we saw with Joel, when, he, with, when, when Peter quoted Joel to talk about the day of Pentecost, where, by the way, the sun turned black and the moon turned to blood, that must be like a stock phrase for, folks, this is earth-shattering. You know, so what God is going to do to remake the planet is so earth-shattering, it might as well have been that the sun goes black and the moon turns to blood. But it's good news because what he's going to do is not destroy it, but put it back together better than new. It's a little thing. You'll, you'll see it when we get to Revelation 20 and 21. It says, a brand new heaven and an earth. The old has been passed away and the sea has been destroyed. You're going, what are you destroying the oceans for? I like swimming. You know what sea is a symbol for? Chaos. Ever lived in chaos? You don't want to live in chaos. God takes the chaos away. And he replaces it with his good wonderful shalom. This is good news to people who are under the boot heel of Rome, who are being chased by the religious persecutors of Jerusalem. This is one day all that will be shattered. And instead we will have a beautiful earth. It's interesting, during, the, during that, all the people who oppose God's good will are running around going, who can stand? You know, and fall on us. All right. Let's go to the next slide. Tum, ta -da, tum, ta -ta -tum. This is the rest of it. Okay, you saw day six, and they're yelling, who can stand? Okay, now we get a nice military symbol. I love this. I didn't realize this was a military symbol. This is why you, you, it isn't so important to read Revelation in community, where other people can tell you stuff you don't know. So, okay, so this is wild. The lamb, remember the, the lion of Judah who conquers and has conquered, past tense, turns out to be a lamb who was slain. And so what does this lamb do? He masses himself an army. And it says 144,000 Israelites. And then he puts a mark of the lamb on his face. You ever heard of the mark of the beast? The mark of the beast is a fake lamb. It says that he looks like a lamb and talks like a dragon. In other words, he's got potty mouth. He utters curses. So already it's setting it up. Which mark do you want? The mark of the lamb or the mark of the beast? This goes all the way back to the first five books of the Bible where it says, Hear, O Lord, the Lord is one. The Lord is your God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And later it says you should love your neighbor as yourself. And that what Jews would do is they would take that scripture, the Shema. That's what it's called. The Shema means here. And they would wrap it up in a mini little scroll and put it in a box right here. And then they would also put it somehow right here on their head and their forehead. They had the mark of Israel's God right here in a box symbolically and on, on, on their wrist. So God's been in, in the business of marking people. When we baptize people, we say, you are marked with the cross of Christ and sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit forever. You want the mark of the Lamb. You don't want the mark of the beast. So 144, 12,000 from all the 12 tribes of Israel. This is a military census. John hears that, just like John heard, look the Lion of Judah, and then saw the Lamb who has been slain. John hears 144,000, and then what he sees is people too numerous to count from every tribe and every nation. And it says they go wherever the Lamb goes. This is a crazy military. And then we have the open... We have the seventh seal, and we have fire raining down the earth, and the earth is nuked once again. So what is all this re-nuking of the earth? I, you know, which is really funny. If you're reading it like a modern Westerner, you're like, wait, you can't nuke the earth. It's done already. 
that tells you the Bible is saying this is symbol. Now, now remember when I talk about that, it's not just symbol. Symbols often point to realities even bigger than the symbols. Restoring the planet is a pretty big deal, don't you think? And guess what? If I am at the top of the pyramid of Babylon or Egypt or Assyria or Persia or Greece or Rome, I don't want the planet messed with. Put it this way, for those who are longing for a better world, no disease, no chaos, no violence, you know, and, and we could go on and on, Revelation is radically good news for you. For those of you, not you, okay, for those of them, I almost made a mistake. I was like, you know, let's not, not do what my, my pastor in my church did. Which one of you is going to heaven? No, um, we're not doing that. But for those who profit off the brokenness of the world, when God puts the world back together, it's going to feel like the sun went black and the moon turned blood red and the stars are falling because your investment plan is going to collapse. Because if you built it on the backs of others, I'm sorry, that stock market's going away. Okay, here we go. Now we're going to the seven trumpets. Yum, da, 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 da. Now this is so cool. Everybody focuses on how awful these things are. But if we look carefully, it's seven of the ten plagues from Egypt. And I've got to end in the next couple minutes or else someone's going to hit me because then you won't get enough small group time. Um, so what's going on here? Why were there seven plagues? What was the point that God did seven plagues to Egypt? Was it just to beat up Egypt because he was mad at them? What was the point of the, of the ten plagues? Somebody just shout it out. Why did God do ten plagues? Yeah, one of them was frogs, yeah. What was the purpose? What was the point? Absolutely. To free the slaves! And to free them from ultimately what looks like Pharaoh's program was genocide. He was freeing his people from certain death. So he went after the empire that was going to kill him. This isn't about how God is mad at the world and going to beat it up. It's how God is freeing bound people. That he's setting the slaves free. He's setting the people scheduled for death. And he's giving them a brand new life. Because Nothing is going to keep them in chains. That's what's going on here. But it's sad, just like Egypt, the nations behave like Pharaoh and say nothing doing because the nations want to cling on to their cannon fodder, to their slaves, as long as possible. Now, what is the nations here? It's any attempt at humans organizing community because we broken sinful humans, when we organize community, we love to treat people as either objects for our advancement or pleasure or as obstacles to be shoved out of the way to keep, so that they don't slow us down. You know where this shows up? Families. Ever had an impulse where you just told a kid, you know, quiet, I'm in charge because you didn't have time to discipline, so you just powered up? No one needs to raise their hand on that one. You know, you know, the same thing with, with either you or your spouse ever just powered up on each other? Yeah, that's empire. See, empire is here too. We have our own pharaoh. The Bible calls that the flesh. He's a nasty tyrant. And when we listen to that pharaoh, we create our own Egypt. And we get enslaved by our own broken self. So this isn't just about what's going to happen, and it's going to happen, folks. It's about what God is working on right here in the inside. This is a big deal, which means God aims to free each one of us from our own broken selves, from sin, death, and the devil, and our flesh. Every one of them is in Egypt. Revelation is about what God is doing right now. Revelation is another way of saying Romans 8, 28, and 29. God is working all things, all situations, all relationships for your benefit, your wholeness, your healing, your freedom, and his mission to save others. That's the same thing in 1 Corinthians 1. The one who had begun a good work in you will complete it on the day of Christ, and he's faithful to do it. This is not about God beating up on the earth. This is God's faithfulness to free the slaves. Isn't that fascinating? And faithfulness to free you. Now, we could keep going, but I think that's enough. So I'm going to go to the story thus far. Dum-da-da-da-da-da-dum. 
What about God's wrath? We saw a lot of wrathfulness going on. God's wrath is built in our sins. We take ourselves down just fine without God lifting a finger. And by the way, so do nations and empires. If you read history, every one of them collapses under their own weight. The other people is God's people are a strange army because at the back of Revelation, they're going to conquer the earth without a single weapon other than the word of God. And its leader is going to have blood all over his robe even before the, the, even before the war starts because he conquers by giving his life, not by taking life. And that's Jesus, whose throne is a cross. We saw, oops, i got to back up on that. I got all excited. And then we saw that God is bound and determined to free his people from Egypt, which was just where we ended. And then finally, we've been talking, God's justice is restorative, not punitive. When, in fact, God's wrath in the Old Testament, the reason why they use that word is sometimes that's the way it feels like, but it's the first move of God to restore stuff. So it's like if you didn't know what you're looking at and you saw someone cutting into a body, what would you call them? You know, a murderer? Open wide the, cam the, the camera and you discover it's a surgeon. Same thing, God's wrath is the beginning of the scalpel that saves the patient. Sometimes it smarts. And then Revelation is Romans 8, 28, 29 on a cosmic scale. We just talked about that. So questions for reflection as we head on out. What situations has God set you free from? In your own personal lives, where have you experienced an exodus? And then the next one is, where do you still need freedom? Where do you still need an exodus in your life? Where are there still pharaohs trying to tell you what to do and keeping you from the grace of Jesus? What's defining your life? What's controlling your life? The grace of the Lamb or the tyrant of Babylon? And then what's one thing you learned today that's new and why does it matter? All right, Lord be with us as we go into our groups that we would learn exactly what you have for us to learn, nothing more, nothing less. All right, group time.